I was a farmer back in 53, and our crops had suffered the worst drought in 40 years. And then we heard of a man called Wilhelm Reich, who claimed he could make rain using a machine he called the Cloudbuster. So, we wrote him a letter, asking for his help. The offer was simple, money for rain. arrived with his son, Peter. He promised his reign within 24 hours. I remember asking him how it worked. He said kind of like a lightning rod, using an energy he called orgone. I only found out later why the men from the government were watching him. If anything, I remember the air getting drier, but I didn't doubt him. Reich had a confidence that stuck to you. Everybody simply waited, passing time, hoping the strange machine would work.
she sure did something. was the last I ever saw of Wilhelm Reich. In the 1930s, Dr. Wilhelm Reich, a prominent Austrian physician and psychoanalyst, discovered a powerful new physical energy, and for the next two decades, devoted his life to the investigation of its laws and properties. He confirmed the existence of this energy in the human body, verified its presence in the atmosphere, developed instrumentation to observe and collect it, and harnessed it for a variety of purposes, from cancer treatment to motor power to weather experimentation. Reich called his discovery Orgone Energy. But tragically, it was a discovery that the world was not ready for. was born in 1897 in Galicia, the easternmost part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, now the Ukraine. He grew up in Bukovina on a large farm operated by his father. Until he was 13 years old, Reich was educated at home by tutors. His mother, to whom he was devoted, committed suicide in 1910, after his father discovered she had had a brief affair with one of the tutors. His father died four years later from tuberculosis. That same year, 1914, the First World War broke out. Within days, Russian troops swept through Bukovina. Reich narrowly escaped being sent to Russia as a hostage and had to flee his home. Later he wrote, I never saw either my homeland or my possessions again. Of a well-to-do past, nothing was left. For the next four years, Reich served in the Austrian army, experiencing what he called the war as a machine. In 1918, the war finally ended. Germany and Austria were defeated. The Austro-Hungarian Empire was broken up and Bukovina became a part of Romania. Alone, homeless, and intellectually starved after four years of war, Reich entered the medical school at the University of Vienna. Reich 
Frank's recognition of the significance of sexuality drew him to the work of Dr. Sigmund Freud, the father of psychoanalysis. Soon he was considered one of Freud's most promising students. Freud had discovered that neuroses are caused by the conflict between natural sexual instincts and the social denial and frustration of those instincts. Freud had also hypothesized the existence of a biological sexual energy in the body. He called it libido and described it as something which is capable of increase, decrease, displacement and discharge and which extends itself over the memory traces of an idea like an electric charge over the surface of the body. But as the years passed, Freud and his followers diluted much of this concept, reducing the libido to little more than a psychological energy or idea. By 1925, Freud had concluded that the libido theory may therefore, for the present, be pursued only by the path of speculation. Reich's clinical observations, however, demonstrated that sexual energy was more than just an idea, and that sexual satisfaction, in fact, alleviated neurotic symptoms. He discovered that the function of the orgasm is to maintain an energy equilibrium by discharging excess biological energy that builds up naturally in the body. If that discharge function is disturbed, as it proved to be in all his patients, this energy continues to build up without adequate release, stagnating and fueling neurotic disorders. Reich's orgasm theory set him apart from his colleagues because it indicated that the libido was a real physical energy that possibly might be measured quantitatively. His clinical work also led to new therapeutic techniques designed to discover and eliminate any impediments to the flow and discharge of this energy. But the widespread existence of human misery forced Reich to conclude that the solution to the problem of neuroses was not treatment, it was prevention. You have to revamp your whole way of thinking, said Reich, so that you don't think from the standpoint of the state and the culture, but from the standpoint of what people need and what they suffer from. Then you arrange your social institutions accordingly. Freud, on the other hand, maintained that culture takes precedence, that sexual instincts must be adapted to the existing social structure. These conflicting positions led to an eventual break between Reich and Freud. In Vienna and later in Berlin, Reich devoted much of his time and money educating working class people about the essential role of sexuality in their lives. I had six clinics in Vienna, said Reich, where people came and received advice once or twice a week. To provide medical and educational help was its purpose. To reach the greatest number of people, he worked within the socialist and communist parties to promote sex education, birth control, divorce rights, and better housing. Reich recalled that in Berlin, there were about 50,000 people in my organization in the first year. Reich was also very outspoken about Germany's turbulent political climate. Unlike most members of the Berlin Psychoanalytic Association, Reich openly opposed the rise of the Nazi party. But his activities exacted a high price. He was denounced by the communists and expelled from the International Psychoanalytic Association, calling these events catastrophes which threaten my personal, professional, and social existence. When asked what he would do, Reich replied, just go on. University of Oslo, 1935. While continuing to teach and develop his innovative therapeutic techniques, Reich began a series of laboratory experiments to verify the existence of a physical, biological energy expressed in the emotions. 
Using human subjects, Reich was able to demonstrate a charge at the skin surface directly related to feelings of pleasure or anxiety. The charge would increase when a subject experienced pleasure and decrease during feelings of unpleasure. From this, Reich concluded that pleasure is the movement of biological energy toward the periphery of the organism, while anxiety is the movement of this energy toward the center. He assumed this energy to be electrical, but was it? And did similar energy processes exist in more basic life forms? Reich discovered that under certain conditions, sterilized and unsterilized substances, such as grass, blood, sand, charcoal, and foodstuffs, disintegrate into pulsating vesicles that exhibit a bluish color. He called these vesicles bions. Reich observed internal motility in the bions, an effect of energy. He also found that certain bions revealed a strong radiation phenomenon seen here as a white field around the organism, and that these bions could kill bacteria and cancer cells. This radiation confirmed the existence of an energy that did not obey any known laws of electricity or magnetism. Reich called this energy orgon because its discovery had evolved from his investigation of the orgasm function and because this energy could charge organic matter. When he published his findings, the scientific and psychiatric communities responded with a vicious year-long attack in the Norwegian press. In the wake of this response, and the inevitability of a Second World War, Reich began to look to America as the future home for his work. In August 1939, Reich sailed for America on the last ship to leave Norway before World War II broke out. Reich settled in the Forest Hill section of New York City. He taught at the New School for Social Research in Manhattan. Published his books in English. Trained American physicians in his therapeutic techniques. And pursued his investigations of orgone energy. Since the energy appeared to be everywhere and to permeate all substances, Reich had to find ways to isolate and collect it in order to study its functions and make it usable. Experiments demonstrated that organic or non-metallic materials, such as cotton, wool, or plastic, attract, absorb, and hold the energy. Metallic materials, steel or iron, attract the energy and quickly reflect it in both directions. On the basis of these experiments, Reich constructed small boxes with alternating layers of organic and metallic materials, with the inner walls lined with metal. The organic layers attract the atmospheric orgone energy, which is then directed inward by the metal layers. Any energy reflected outward by the metal layers is reabsorbed by the organic material, attracted back to the metal and directed toward the inside of the box. The result, a higher concentration of orgone energy inside the box. The more layers, the higher the concentration. This accumulation of energy can be verified in a variety of ways. For example, a constant temperature difference exists between the air above the box and in the surrounding air, contradicting the second law of thermodynamics. There also exists a slower electroscopic discharge rate in the higher orgone concentration within the box. These layered boxes, known as orgone energy accumulators, became a valuable tool in Reich's scientific and medical research.
Initially, they were used to observe visual manifestations of orgone energy within the enclosure and to test the effects of orgone radiation on cancer mice. Because his results with cancer mice were so promising, Reich decided to test the effects of orgone radiation on human subjects. He constructed orgone energy accumulators that were large enough for a person to sit in, and in 1942, he began experimental treatments with cancer patients. They were all terminal cases. Wright promised no cure and charged no money. Over a period of time, the patients showed marked improvement, relief of pain, healthier blood condition, weight gain, and the shrinkage and elimination of tumors. Despite these positive results, the patients died, reinforcing Reich's conviction that cancer is a bioenergetic shrinking following emotional resignation, and that the tumors themselves are not the disease, but merely a local manifestation of a deeper systemic disorder. Once again, Reich's focus became prevention. Reich also discovered that water and high humidity absorb and hold orgone energy, making it difficult to carry out experimental work in New York City during the summer. In 1940, on a camping trip to New England, Reich discovered the Rangeley Lakes region in Maine. With its low humidity and clean air, it provided an ideal environment for his work. In 1942, Reich purchased an old farm bordering on a small lake. He called it Organon and envisioned it as a permanent home for the various branches of his work. In 1945, a student's laboratory was built. Three years later, construction began on an Orgone Energy Observatory, which included additional laboratory facilities, Reich's study and library, and outdoor observation decks. Funding for these buildings and for Reich's research came exclusively from his own income as a physician and teacher and from loans and contributions by students. By 1947, after less than eight years in America, Reich's work was attracting considerable interest as Oregon research expanded into new areas of psychiatry, medicine, and biophysics. One of Reich's most significant new developments was the discovery of a motor force in orgone energy that had enormous practical implications. Here, Reich demonstrates a small motor being propelled by orgone energy from the body. And here, motor power is provided by orgone energy harnessed from the atmosphere. With the development of Organon, Reich's dream of a home for his work was slowly becoming a reality. Sadly, it was a dream that he would not see fulfilled. In 1947, this article written by freelance journalist Mildred Brady appeared in New Republic magazine. It was filled with distortions and innuendos about Reich's sexual theories and orgone research. Brady's most inflammatory claim was that Reich was building accumulators of orgone energy which are rented out to patients 
who presumably derive orgastic potency from it. Implying that Reich was a danger to the public, Brady challenged the medical authorities to take action against him. Two months later, the article was brought to the attention of the Federal Food and Drug Administration. The result was a 10-year campaign by the FDA designed to destroy Reich's work. The FDA focused on the orgone energy accumulator, which Reich and other physicians were using experimentally with patients. Convinced that the accumulator was being fraudulently promoted as a sexual and medical device, FDA agents spent years interviewing Reich's associates, physicians, students, and patients looking for dissatisfied accumulator users. None were ever found. As the FDA attack continued, so did Reich's work. He continued to develop new ways to visualize, measure, and harness orgone energy from the atmosphere. The Cloud Buster, for example, was an experimental instrument that could affect weather patterns by altering concentrations of orgone energy in the atmosphere. A set of hollow metal pipes and cables inserted into water creates a stronger orgone energy system than that in the surrounding atmosphere. Water, which strongly attracts and absorbs orgone, draws the atmospheric energy through the pipes. This movement of orgone from a lower to a higher energy system was used by Reich to create clouds and to dissipate them. In 1953, during a long drought that threatened the main blueberry crop, several farmers offered to pay Reich if he could bring rain to the parched region. The Weather Bureau had forecast no rain for several days when Reich began his cloud-busting operations. Ten hours later, a light rain began to fall. Over the next few days, close to two inches fell. The blueberry crop was saved. In February 1954, the FDA filed a complaint for injunction against Reich in the federal court in Portland, Maine. The complaint declared that orgone energy does not exist. It asked the court to prohibit the shipment of accumulators in interstate commerce and to ban Reich's published literature, which they claim was labeling for the accumulators. Reich responded to the complaint with a lengthy letter to Judge John Clifford, explaining that he could not appear in court since doing so would allow a court of law to judge basic scientific research. Scientific matters, he wrote, can only be clarified by prolonged, faithful, bona fide observations in friendly exchange of opinion, never by litigation. I therefore submit, in the name of truth and justice, that I shall not appear in court. Judge Clifford did not accept Reich's letter as a valid legal response, and the injunction was issued on default, as if Reich had never responded at all. But the injunction was even more excessive than the initial complaint. It ordered that all Oregon energy accumulators and their parts were to be destroyed. It ordered all materials containing instructions for the use of the accumulator to be destroyed as well. It also banned a list of Reich's books containing statements about Oregon energy until such time as all references to Oregon energy were deleted. After the initial shock, Reich continued his work, traveling to Arizona to experiment with the Cloudbuster in the dry desert environment. While he was there, and without his knowledge, one of Reich's students, Dr. Michael Silvert, moved a truckload of accumulators and books from Rangeley, Maine to New York City, a direct violation of the injunction. As a result, the FDA charged Reich and Silvert with criminal contempt of court. In 1956, both men were found guilty. Reich was sentenced to two years in a federal prison. While Reich appealed his sentence, 
the government carried out the destruction of accumulators and literature. In New York City, several tons of Reich's books and other publications were burned in one of the city's garbage incinerators, including titles that were only to have been banned. This destruction of literature constitutes one of the most heinous acts of censorship in United States history. All appeals denied on March 11, 1957, two weeks shy of his 60th birthday, Wilhelm Reich was imprisoned at the Federal Penitentiary in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania. He died there of heart failure eight months later, on November 3, 1957, and was buried at Organon. But the tragedy of Reich's death should not be allowed to overshadow the richness of his life. For while he lived, he was truly alive. In the course of the history of natural science, it always happened that profound or true thoughts or true facts were always either distorted or flattened out. The danger, especially of distortion, is particularly great in the case of urbanity. We must be scientific, we cannot be political in these matters. And I personally declare that I would be the first to fight with all my strength, with whatever I've got, against such a distortion of our principles. It is April 3rd, 1952, at Orgonon, Rangeley, Maine. I, Wilhelm Reich, am sitting alone in the large room in the lower house. All people are gone. In the morning and the whole day yesterday, a meeting took place of the members of the Board of, Trist the Board of Trustees of the foundation which carries my name. <clears throat> Everybody's gone now, and I would like to add a few words to the recording we made yesterday and today of the disaster which struck Orbola. <clears throat> There's 
nobody here to listen to what I'm saying. The recording apparatus is the only witness. I hope that someone will at some time in the future listen to this recording with great respect. Respect for the courage that was necessary to sustain the research work in organ energy and life energy all through these years. I shall not go into the great strain, into the details, into the worries, the sleepless nights, the tears, the expenditures and money and effort, the patience which I had to have with all my workers and with all my students. <clears throat> I would like only to mention the fact that there's nobody around, there's not a single soul either here at Oregon or down in New York who would fully and really from the bottom of his existence understand what I'm doing and be with me in what I'm doing. They are all very good people. They are decent, honest, hardworking. I trust them. We are very good friends, all of them or most of them. But this does not alter the fact that they all, without any exception, are against, I say, are against what I am doing. Every single one of them spites me, interferes with my effort, crosses it out, blots out, flattens out, does one thing or another thing, whatever it may be, to diminish <coughs> my effort, no, to diminish the effects of my effort, to blot out the sharpness and acuity of my thoughts to reduce to rubble and nothing or nothingness what I have elaborated in about now 30, uh, four, uh, 33 or 34 years of systematic thinking and in about 40, 40 years of human suffering since about 1912, or rather 1910, when my mother died. There is not a single soul around who would fully understand or would not say no to it all. This no is identical with I don't want it. I don't like it. I loathe it. Why is it here? Why does he have to exist? Why does he, why does not, doesn't he sit down and take it easy? Why did he have to uh, start this Oranur experiment which gives us so much trouble? They see only the trouble. They don't see or they don't want to realize what it means for medicine, biology, and science in general, as well as philosophy, to have this aura going. To them, it is mostly a bother, an inducer of sickness, suffering, and at times, I have the distinct feeling that they believe or they do not dare quite to admit their own thoughts that I may have gone haywire. This 
reaction of my closest friends and co-workers to the situation here is exactly the same that has harassed the human race for as much as we can say 8,000 or 10,000 years since patriarchy has ruled its destinies and since the natural love was extinguished in the newborn infants. I shall not go into that, it's all written up in my publications. Whoever knows these publications also knows what that means. The discovery of the life energy would have been accomplished long ago had this I don't want it, I fear it, I loathe it, I'll kill it, I'll flatten it out, I won't let it uh, live or exist. If that had not been in their structures, not in their desires, not in their positive conscious wishes, they're all decent and, and, and good people. No, it is in the structure. It is somehow in their tissues, in their blood. They cannot tolerate anything that has to do with overgrown energy or life energy or what they call God or what is their deepest longing for love for fulfillment. They cannot tolerate it and they fear it. They fear it by way of structure. They are tissues, they are blood cannot stretch out, cannot take it, evades it, avoids it, and lotus it. I do not say all this to uh, depreciate their efforts, their honor, their loves, their lives. <clears throat> I say it because it is true, because it turns up in every single move, in every single word, in every single opinion, in every single paper, in every single thing they did to, to whatever ever had to do with discovery, with the discovery of genitality, life, love, uh, such people as Lawrence, or such philosophies as Giordano Brunus, or such great lives as Jesus Christ, and so forth, and so forth. It is a sad, lonely chapter of the human race. I don't feel that I am ob obligated to solve this riddle or to do anything about it. I happen to discover the life energy. I happen to induce the Oranur experiment. I know what it means for the future development of medicine and biology philosophy and natural science. I'm fully aware of it. And in, these, in this awareness, I am completely alone. There's no soul anywhere far and wide to talk to, to give, uh, to give one's, one's feelings, to let one's feelings go freely, to speak like as friends speak to each other. This is all.